Um, welcome, everybody, um, at the Don't Panic uh, talk. Uh, I hope everybody is aware that this is a talk about uh, Kanban and some agility and about flow. Uh, so if you're here to learn about development, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to help you there. But uh, although I have been a developer once, uh, I will introduce myself in a minute. Um, so it's going to be a talk about uh, the learning zone and the comfort zone and the panic zone and how the Kanban maturity model is going to help you with that. And uh, I'm a Kanban coach, so this is, uh, this is the work I'm, I'm living in, and that's, uh, that's why I'm going to talk about it. Um, I'm Maarten Hoppen. Uh, I'm a drummer. Uh, I'm a vapor. Uh, still doing a bit of vaping. I think it's better than snooze, but you never know. Um, and I, um, I'm an intermittent faster, so that's why there is a bottle, uh, a box of fruit and yogurt in the, in the corner. And I also like to do some uh, some hobby video editing, but that's not my uh, my, my big business. Uh, and as you see, there's a lot of sticky notes on the wall. I'm uh, completely addicted to sticky notes, um, like every agilist. And therefore, COVID was a very terrible time because we all went digital. And uh, now uh, I left all my uh, sticky notes at home. So that's uh, the idea. Um, as I said, I'm an Agile coach. I work at VX Company. That's uh, uh, a company in the Netherlands. Uh, not a very big company, like 300 people or something. Uh, they we do a lot of development. And um, I'm also an accredited Kanban trainer at the Kanban University. So I teach a number of Kanban trainings, the Kanban courses. And I'm a professional Scrum trainer at Scrum.org. And I did a, a Scrum Master uh, training uh, as a workshop in the beginning of this week, so Monday and Tuesday. And yes, I have been a developer in the past, and I started with COBOL, so I even created a lot of legacy code um, that you're trying to fix now, I guess. And uh, then I went into the Java realm, and I did some Groovy and Ruby, uh, but then I pretty much passed out because I couldn't handle it anymore. And uh, I took, I took the, the hints for granted that I was more like a people person than a technical person. Although I always thought I was going to be lead architect or something. But uh, after a number of years, people kept telling me that was not the case. I thought, well, then it might be a good idea to stop being technical. Um, and that's when I, when I went into the whole agile coaching thing. And that's what I'm doing now for about 14 years. So <coughs> I'm, uh, I'm pretty seasoned at the moment. And I've seen a lot of stuff. And... Uh, Maybe people went to the Billy Holly's um, uh, talk yesterday. Uh, that, that was nice, but I think the one he did the evening before, Tuesday evening at the Norwegian.net user group uh, meetup, uh, he had a very nice talk also about that Agile was going to uh, go away and those kind of things, but uh, he, he had some very interesting thinking. And I'm very in favor of that because I'm a pragmatic Agilist, I think. Uh, Scrum is not the silver bullet, Kanban is not the silver bullet, extreme programming is not the silver bullet. So I always think that you should take the pragmatic approach and always pick stuff from the toolbox that you need. And also don't use stuff because they tell you so, only use it because you think it's going to work and it really helps you in your context. So that's, uh, that's who I am. Um, does any one of you don't know what Kanban is? Oh, everybody knows. That's cool. Um, then I'm uh, I'm going to quickly uh, go through it because I'm I want to make make sure that everybody is on the same page. Uh, the Kanban method is not uh, a project management method, so it's not a method to do project management, and it's not a software delivery management method. So it's uh, for lifecycle management or something like that. Uh, uh, I think most of you know Kanban as having um, stickies on the wall or uh, a different visual uh, digital board and having the to-do doing done lane or maybe an, a number of more lanes or columns in there. Um, and that's probably part of Kanban or at least Kanban is using a lot of that stuff. It's about visualization. Um, but for, in essence, uh, uh, Kanban is a management method for directly improving your service delivery. It's catalyzing that improvement and it's trying to evolve your business to be fit for purpose. So Kanban is much more a change management method than it is a project management or a process delivery uh, message, uh, method or something like that. Yeah? 
<coughs> and why, uh, why Common came to life is pretty much because um, uh, we, we all hope that when we do a change, we are starting at some level, so you're here, and then we do the transition, and we aim to go for the higher goal, and we, all, we, we, we hope that the transition is going to be, with, we're starting here, we're going up, and now we're on the higher level. But that is never the case. The case is that uh, reality is more like this, just like the, the J-curve from Satir, you probably know it. And the, the problem from, uh, from the J-curve is that there's a lot of uh, resistance going on, and if, if, if the, the change is taking too much time or is going too, too deep into the change, you need a lot of organizational uh, resistance or a tolerance to accept that change. And uh, when we do a big change in Agile, so an Agile transformation and doing like SAFE or uh, a real, real complete implementation of Scrum, I think we see, we see the, the big uh, system change and we call that in lean terms, we call that kaikaku. Uh, as Agilist and lean person, the, the more Japanese terms you know, the higher on the ladder of hierarchy. So, uh, so I, I, will, I will name a number of them, so then you know that I'm one. Uh, <laughs> no, but Kaikaku, that's, that's one of them. And what we prefer in the Kanban world is doing smaller steps, so having the smaller steps to improve, and that's what we call, probably you know it, uh, Kaizen. Yeah, so that's, the, that's what we see. Um, there are a number of change principles in uh, Kanban. There's change principles and service delivery principles, but because it's about change, I think I'm going to name them first. And that's start with what you do now. Um, and that means with everything you've got in place, so your processes, your roles, your functions, your working agreements. We're not going to start changing them. We're first going to start where you are now and making them visible and visualize them. And then we are going to aim for evolutionary change, so small steps continuously improving. And we want to stimulate leadership in all levels. And uh, at the end of the talk, I will come back a little bit to that leadership thing, because I think the essence of all changes are based on the right leadership that's in your organization. Um, but get rid of the leaders and put the right leaders in there is probably a difficult thing, so uh, we need to change them a bit up uh, differently. Yeah? Then next to the change th um, uh, principles, we also have got service delivery principles. And I think people who know Lean know these principles pretty okay. Uh, focus on the customer, so start with the customer in mind. Manage your work, your flow, yeah? let the people self-organize around it. That's like an agile thinking. And uh, we want to develop and improve the working agreements. In, in Kanban, we call them uh, explicit policies. So something to know about. The last one that I wanted to uh, touch upon what Kanban is, is the six practices that Kanban is delivering us. And that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the, uh, I think it was the first time it was written down was by uh, David Anderson in the blue book, Kanban book, Evolutionary Change for Your Service Delivery uh, Business. And he came up with six pr uh, practices, and that's visualize, visualize your work. I'm, so I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, wha what you probably do also if you do Scrum or Extreme Programming or uh, if you're using uh, Azure DevOps or uh, Atlassian or something, you visualize your work. Um, because every work item, every, everything you do in your life probably has some kind of workflow, so you can visualize that workflow. We're trying to limit our work in progress, limit your whip. Um, we manage the flow of work in that case and we try to create explicit policies. Probably in your, um, if you are using Scrum, you're doing a definition of done, you've got the other explicit policies, but you can also think about uh, pool options, uh, pool rules, um, uh, when are we, uh, what color of stickies are we going to use for specific work categories and those kind of things, so th those are explicit policies. We're going to use feedback loops, although Kanban doesn't really de define any real meetings, except the daily meeting, the common meeting. Other meetings are not really explicitly in there, uh, but we want to have feedback loops, and uh, the essence is to improve collaboratively and evolutionary. Yeah, so uh, doing experiments, fail-safe uh, experiments, because that's what we, we are doing. We're, we're an evolutionary thinking uh, method. Okay. So now everybody's on par with what Kanban is, yeah? And I do, I do this, this, this part, I do in a two-day training, so 
I don't know why I did it just in a few minutes. Uh, that's, a, that's a bad man, uh, marketing, I think. Um, next step. The reasons, at, at least what's my undertitle, uh, that's the, the two reasons why uh, a lot of agile transformations fail or stall. And I think, uh, I think you will all have come across them. I probably, probably you do, at least. Who, who is doing some kind of agile in their organization? Yeah, I think pretty much everybody. A few not, but um, <laughs> what? Some kind of agile, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it's uh, if if you just mention the word word, then it's already agile, isn't it? Um, um, and what we see is two kinds of uh, of failure, and that's the overreaching failure, and the false summit plateau. And um, the overreaching failure is pretty much we are aiming too high, and we're not able to to uh, to get that done. Are we okay with a low mediocre level of performance? And those two are pretty much always the case or at least sometimes uh, not. But, uh, and what we see in the overreaching is that the kaikaku, so the big change, uh, goes over the heads of most of the people. And that's where we have that deep investment, big investment, a lot of organizational tolerance is needed. And uh, the bigger and the longer it's it is, uh, the, the more problematic it is. And what I see is that, and I think I've been one of those persons some, somewhere in time, that I was really bragging about how cool stuff I could do with Agile. So I came across uh, uh, teams that were trying to do some agility, and then I came with the highest high-end uh, definitions of Agile and doing new stuff and innovations and uh, talking with other Agile coaches about how cool this stuff is. And that doesn't matter because it's about the team, it's about the ones you are going to help. So that's a very bad bad stance for an Agile coach. An Agile coach should always be servant and a servant leader towards the organization and the people. So always be humble and nimble about what you're doing. So I think that's something that I've learned a lot in the last couple of years. Um, and the problem is, if this happens, is that um, <coughs> the organization is not going to be able to uh, fix that change. And at one moment in time, the sale, it doesn't, doesn't deliver any results, so the improvements stay out and they decide to stop the change, they panic, and they go with another change. And then they go into a downward spiral because the next change will probably also deliver a J-curve in Satir's uh, terms. So that's a problem. Um, the other one is um, the false summit. And that's where people say, well, this is probably the best we can do, and we feel comfortable with it, so we, ex we accept uh, that level of uh, performance, and that's probably mediocre if we don't step more. Um, does anybody know how much time uh, Toyota took to, uh, to become like 75% of a performance increase uh, from the beginning? Do you know any? Does anybody know? Shout a, a number of years. <laughs> 10, I hear. 80 years. So <laughs> Toyota says we've got 80 years to improve 75% of what's possible. Yeah? So if you think that after a year or two years or three years, you're done with your improvements, I always say think again. Of course, that's why we Agile coaches still have work, but, um, <laughs> but that's, that's also, that I think that's an important uh, knowledge. Uh, things are always changing. You should always be uh, uh, committing to that change and helping and embracing that change. And uh, so the context is, is futile there. So always try to, to improve. I think that's an important part. And don't stop too often too, uh, and too early. Um, so they think, they assume they have reached their summit the, uh, the, the, the on top. And they just cab along, and that's good. And we see a lot of resignation then, and lack of urgency, and lack of uh, challenge. So to recurse one more. Um, Come on this evolutionary change, doing small steps in Kaizen, uh, step by step by step. But the biggest question then is, how do we initiate though that, that continuous small step of improvement and small step of change? And I think that's the biggest, the biggest question we have to address here. Um, and that's where my first subtitle comes from, and that's about the learning zone. So um, 
people who do um, sports coaching or uh, teaching music uh, instruments or something like that, or being a teacher at school or uh, at someone else, but if you do something like that or you're being a coach in your, at your work, um, you probably all have to, have to do something like this, and that's getting people into the learning zone, in the stretch zone. And um, what we see in, 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 that, in that area is that there are pretty much three zones. You've got your comfort zone, your learning zone, or stretch zone, and your panic zone. And um, the learning zone is our sweet spot of improvement. That's the place where we learn the most, we achieve the most, we, we, we improve ourselves and the company and your team and those kind of things. And therefore, uh, as a sports coach or as an instrument uh, teacher, uh, but also as an as a agile coach, we are trying to get everybody in that learning zone, or the whole company even in that learning zone. Um, does anybody know um, the cartoon from, I think it's from Disney, from The Croods? Yeah, that's with the, the, the caveman, uh, with uh, Shrug, I think he's called, uh, that's the, the, the Padre da Familia. Um, and he, uh, he, he keeps them all in a cave, so we've got a, we've got a cave with, uh, with them in there. And he, uh, he's always protecting them, so uh, he keeps them in the safe zone, in the comfort zone. And uh, the idea of an Agile coach or a, a, a Kanban coach is to get them out of the comfort zone, that safe zone, and get them into the learning zone. So that's also what he does. So he, he get away that, that rock, he lose them into uh, the comfort, oh no, and then something happens. And I think that's the biggest problem. So we get into a panicky moment. And the panic is that there are big monsters, a lot of uh, diseases going on in there. And uh, so. If you get them in the panic zone, the biggest problem is that they will get into the cave again and they will stay there for longer than they've been, than they've been there before. So panic creates uh, a fear and anxiety and uh, it creates a flight uh, movement. And you will fly into your comfort zone again and you will stay there for longer than you did before. So I think it's a very important part as being a coach or a trainer or a teacher to avoid getting them into the panic zone. So that's, that's, that's one of the parts that's part of what we're, I'm going to tell you. Um, and the Kanban maturity model is going to help you with that. That's the idea behind it. So um, let's uh, KMM, that's the Kanban maturity model. And we call that an ECM, an evolutionary change model. So we're all about evolutionary change. So small steps, Kaizen-like uh, changes. And the common maturity model um, declares three aspects, and I'm, I'm not sure if I have to cover all of them, but we're going to dive a bit more into the practices in a while. But these are the three aspects of Kanban maturity model. So we've got culture, and that's uh, this is how we live here. This is uh, the value and the principles of the organization. Sometimes written, sometimes not written, but uh, a lot of it uh, is defined by behavior and actions that are taken there. Yeah? Um, then you've got uh, the outcomes, um, and that is the demonstration of the results. This is uh, how, how our business looks like, this is how the outside world sees us, so that those are the outcomes. And um, the practices are the parts that we, that's how we do things around here, so that's what we put into practice. And those are routine activities, observable patterns, and those kind of things. So this is also where we talk about the practices of Kanban. So what we talked about just about uh, a few minutes ago, the six practices, like visualize, work in progress, limits, and those kind of things, those are in that area. Yeah, so those are practices. Um, and now I'm going to show you the model itself. Uh, don't be afraid, don't panic. Uh, it is a big one, uh, and probably not readable from behind, and that's perfectly okay because I'm going to break it down in much simpler pieces. So we've got the cultural side and of values, the cultural values, then we've got the maturity levels and they start with zero and we think that everybody already is at zero but uh, if you think you're not then we have the first step to make. Uh, and it goes up until six and uh, six is like um, uh, uh, not, not interesting enough, and five also to, to talk about yet, but the first three or four are probably the most interesting to look at. And on the right side, you see the six practices, the visualize, limit width, manage flow, and those kind of things. Yeah? And I'm going to walk through uh, very quickly through the maturity levels. And uh, the maturity levels are on the left side for you. And we start with zero, and we call that oblivious. So... Um, 
It's all based on achievement, individual achievement, individual results. Um, do, does anybody use any, th any kind of a Kanban system for themselves, like a personal Kanban or something, to do doing done lists or to do lists? Yeah, a number of people do that. Um, that's, that's when you're in a team and you're still having your own personal Kanban lists. That's pretty okay. I think it's also very good for your personal uh, productivity, effectiveness and, uh, effectiveness and efficiency. But uh, when we want to go into a team, we need to work together. Uh, the, the, the thing of, uh, the, the, the how do you call it, uh, a team, one plus one is three. That idea is probably also true. So if you want to become a team, we have to work together and then personal achievement is not the only thing in what it's all about. It's also about togetherness. So that's, that's the next step. We, we think the first step that we need to take, if we don't have that already, is becoming a team. So having a team-focused Kanban system. And a lot of practices on the right side, I'm going to dive in them a bit more uh, lately, later. Um, but it's about um, collaboration, uh, talking together, initiatives, uh, and those kinds of things. And of course, if we have to work together, we have to be transparent. Uh, so transparency is also part of it. Um, so those are the first two, the, the, the oblivious personal Kanban, and then we go into a team-focused environment. And I think that's the first step most agile environments already take. Then the second step, that's the customer driven. I think uh, like uh, Scrum and Safe and all those agile uh, methods are trying to deliver something that's all about customer driven uh, and trying to deliver something that the customer cares for. And then we get uh, uh, processes that are efficient and consistent, but the outcomes will probably not be yet. Then we need uh, some good uh, prioritization, a good product owner and those kind of things. But here we see most of the Kanban uh, practices or values come into play, like the acts of le leadership, customer awareness, evolutionary change, flow. So all, all of them are uh, Kanban and lean um, uh, values that we already know. Um, we also see delivery Kanban and discovery Kanban here, and that's what some people also call upstream and downstream, uh, customer Kanban, a developer Kanban or something. So we already got something in play there with two two types of common systems working together and uh, having an upstream flow with your, um, with, with your uh, product backlogs and the downstream flow with your ops or something like that. So there is something going on there already. And then in the third step, and I might say something about the fourth, uh, is the fit for purpose step. And that's where we really try to have consistent outcomes. So also having your customer involved in your feedback loops and getting, uh, getting, uh, getting to meeting expectations and having service uh, delivery or service level expectations or something like that. And there is what we see that we, uh, we have like the values of agreement, balance, customer service, uh, all those terms. So this is, this is where I think most of our agile practices are trying to aim for. This is where we want to, uh, what one want to achieve. The next step, I'm not going to dive much more into that one, is the risk hedged model. And that's where we not only do it right at the moment, so we, do, we have a good, uh, uh, good, good thing going on, but it's also being prepared for the future. So risk hedge means that you already know the risks of the future, that you look up, up ahead five years uh, uh, up front or something, and that that's what, what is all part of that process. So that's, that's much more mature than most organizations are doing. I think if you, if you reach level three, then uh, you're pretty happy uh, as most organizations. Five and six, market lever built for survival. Uh, in the book of uh, the common maturity model that David wrote, uh, with also a lot of audit uh, definitions in there, uh, you can read more about it, but uh, the only one who is teaching this is David himself, uh, and that's, uh, that's okay for me. Okay, uh, as I said, we've got six practices. Um, the visualized practices, so that's the first one. Then we've got limit whip, manage flow, make policies explicit, feedback loops, and improve collaboratively and experimentally. Um, I'm going to do some examples later on, and we'll focus on the visualized and the limit whip so that you understand what it's all about. Um, but this, this is the model, so this is the big model that we, we use the common maturity model level, uh, level model for, uh, maturity model for. Um, What's also interesting is that you see, um, at least I'm going to step one back, I think that's good. Uh, then I have to step forward again. You see the one and then the one to, uh, the, the zero to one, 
and then you see the one and the one to two. So those are different, different steps within that same level. And we call them the transition and consolidation practices. So those are two different practices. And uh, what's interesting about those practices is that um, if you uh, have transition practices, those practices will be more like visualizing, make, making people aware, and you can, you can push a little. So that's, that's where trainers and coaches are, doing, are giving a little bit of stressors. So getting people out of their comfort zone, making them aware that they can achieve a bit more so that we can, we can tickle them and make, make them aware that they can do something. That's, that's where it's okay as a coach to, to push a bit. Yeah, so that's, that's okay. When you go into the consolidation practices, that's where we want to consolidate the next, we call it equilibrium, uh, so the next level where we want to balance. Um, that's the place where we want to consolidate and that's, that's getting probably more resistance because we have to create new rules, new agreements, we have to fix items. And that's the, that's the moment where, as a coach and as a trainer, we need to let them pull. So we, we are going to offer them practices, but we're not going to push them in. So that's an important part. So we push to stress, make them aware, make them visualize, make them understand that something else can be better. And then when, when they make that step to become better, then we offer them practices to make sure that they, uh, they consolidate that level, that new equilibrium they're in. So what you see in this model is uh, the, the zero to one, the one, one to two. So those are the transition level practices, transition level one, level two, level three. And those are different practices than the practices that were on, this on the second part, and that's the consolidation practices. And they, they both do just what I said. Um, as a Kanban coach, and I'm going to stress it once more, um, we are the engine of that evolutionary change. <coughs> and I think it's important, oh, this is my drawing, yeah, I did some drawing. Um, um, we are not a puppet master, so we're not going to uh, um, play with them as dolls. We are going to be servant leaders. So it's very important to, to become a servant leader and to uh, offer them help and to facilitate them. And you're not going to be the one that's directing the change. You're going to facilitate the change. And that's an important part. Uh, do people know the OODA loop? That's here, OODA. That's uh, observe, orient, decide, and act. And I think that's pretty much, much the, the, the scheme you are working in as a, as a coach. So you always observe what is happening. You're going to uh, look into the working agreements and the working environments and the models they are using and the practices they are using at the moment. And uh, that's where you know and understand what is happening. And with that understanding, you're going to make the next step. And you're going to look into, okay, if this is the level they're at now, then le let's say they're at level one, uh, then we are not going to create or push practices that are level three or four or five because they, they don't accept it. They will get into the panic zone then. So the first thing you have to do is uh, look into the practices that are going to help you to, be to step into the next maturity level, so the next level of practices. And uh, if you know that, then that's what you're going to do. And if it's uh, in transition level, you're going to push it a bit. And if it's in the consolidation level, you're going to offer them those practices. And when they have uh, implemented them, then you can look again. So it's a constant revisiting of that loop, that OODA loop of uh, where are we now? How can we decide what to do now? And then act on it. So that's the constant loop that we need to go through. Now I've got two examples. Uh, and. Uh, I, di I did some webinars, and I'm sorry they're in Dutch. Uh, uh, is there anyone in the room who understands Dutch? Okay, yeah, a bit. Okay, so you can look at it probably and then understand what's happening. Uh, the others are just uh, then, uh, th like probably gray noise to, to get to sleep or something. That's good. But um, um, if I, I might do an English version if, uh, if I get enough response for this, uh, this session. Um, but I've got two, two examples, and it's, it's about uh, the Kanban for Teams uh, webinar. And uh, I, di I did a Kanban 101 first to make everybody understand. And the first part I did was a bit about that, uh, that Kanban uh, 101. And in that Kanban for Teams, there are different levels of uh, a team Kanban. And we're going to look into two, two parts of them. And uh, the first one is going to be uh, the, the whip limits per person. So that's pretty much like a, a personal Kanban thing 
gather together aggregated personal Kanban on one board and everybody has got their own stuff to do and uh, they're not really working uh, together. Um, so this is a whip limit per person and um, it's, it's one step from personal Kanban so they can work together but they have their own whip limits. And what we see here is uh, on top, uh, we call that an unlimited work in progress. So uh, it's, uh, it's the how, however, how much you want to put in that column, that's okay. That's not a real pool system because the pool system needs a work in progress limit to make sure that we can use Little's law if people know the Little's law from networking or something, that's also the same uh, Little's law. Uh, we need a, a limit because otherwise we cannot uh, manage the flow in the system. And what we also see is there are people on the bench. <coughs> so those are avatars or something on the bench. And um, we have got orphan items. So items that are not uh, owned by anyone. And that's probably not a good thing. So th these items are waiting there and nobody is working on them at the moment. So they're, they're just there. And I don't know what it is, but that's, that's, what, that's what the case is. Yeah? I'm not sure if this is readable, but I'll, I'll help out a bit. Um, so what we see in that board is that we have, at least we have got some visualization of the work. Yeah? So uh, we see several individuals and they have some kind of uh, aggregated individual Kanban board. So personal Kanban on one board with a number of people. Uh, we see avatars, they are using avatars in that system. So that looks like, uh, like, like that level. And we see a per person whip limit. And how can we see that? That's uh, like the number of avatars you have per person. So let's say everybody has got three avatars and they can put on the board. And if your avatars are uh, empty, so you don't have anybody on the bench anymore, then you cannot do any more work. So you've got a per person whip limit in that, that case. Uh, so I think we can safely assume based on visualize and limiting width, and of course there are another of other practices that are also in play, but we can safely assume that they are at least at the transition phase from zero to one. Yeah, so that will be uh, it. And therefore we can look at how can we improve uh, visualized work by the whole team and not by persons uh, to create a real Kanban board and uh, a team Kanban board. And we want to make some more uh, basic policies. And I think th the last one, and I think that's the most important one, is to establish some kind of a team whip limit. So now we've got uh, unlimited columns, and that's a bad thing if you want to create a pool system. So I think it's a good idea to, to bring them into that, uh, that environment. So we offer them those items, and we will see what they think will be the best things to do. Yeah? So this is, this is from zero to one, and stepping into the, 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 the first one uh, maturity level. The next one is more like an aggregated team Kanban. I'm sure that a lot of you are in this uh, environment. We see two teams. Team one is doing development and team two is doing testing or we've got an analysis team and a development team or a development team and a deployment team. So two teams that are in the same workflow with a customer asking, asking for something and then going through a number of teams at in this moment too delivering something in the end. And, um, and those teams are working together with a column in the middle, and that column in the middle is the done column. And that one is also not limited. And therefore, we have got two common systems, we call that. Because if you've got an unlimited column in the middle, then we have a decoupled system, because both systems can have some predictability, but they have to work with each other, and that, that un unlimited column in the middle can be as long as, as you want, so that will not be predictable. Yeah, so that's, that's why it's a decoupled system, and we've got two common systems in this way. Um, you can also say we've got two moments we can commit. So we commit in the next column, and we commit in the column before testing. That's also a commitment point. Uh, what we also see is something like a next column. So that does mean they have something like um, in, in Scrum, we will probably call that uh, the, the sprint backlog. Uh, so we, we pulled stuff in from a product backlog into a sprint backlog. And the next column at, at least means something. This is the next highest priority to take up. Yeah? So there is some, some, pro some prioritization going on. And <coughs> we have got something like, it, it says P1. So priority one or something like a bug or a defect or a, an impediment or something that's going on. So they at least we see more than one type of work. Yeah, so there are more work ca categories going on. 
Um, so if we, if we are trying to translate this to the common maturity model, we see in that model a number of things. We see that uh, at level two to three, so transitioning from two to three, they already have something like a commit status. So that's the next column that we've seen. Yeah? So there's, a, there's something that we are going to commit to working on, and like the sprint backlog I said. Um, they've got a workflow that's uh, based on teams, um, but they are not coupled yet. So they've got a, a two teams aggregated Kanban. Uh, so that's there, 1.3. And we've got uh, the first steps on limiting WIP with the aggregated service. So they have got their own WIP limits, but I think it's a good idea to also look into couple them and have a, a, a limit on that unlimited column at first. Um, what I also see is, um, but I'm not sure, I, it looks like there is a failure demand or a, a different type of work in that system. So I have to investigate it a bit more. We have to uh, talk to the, to the team and have to find out, is this really what you, you are using? Is this a different working category or something? So there is some kind of failure demand and value demand going on. So that's also interesting to see. So what we can assume here is that they are in transition to from, one to uh, from two to three, but they are not there yet. We see a lot of stuff that's not done, especially the, the right column of visualization is not there yet. So we probably have to focus a bit more on that and push a bit there. And if that's going right, then we have to go and to have some activity-based uh, WIP limits. And then we can probably step into the next environment of uh, fit for purpose. So then uh, get, get into the next level of maturity. Okay. Um, so what do we have now? Um, we have an environment that the common maturity model offers us. I'm going to step almost in the, the concluding. Um, and uh, Kanban is helping us as coaches and as change managers and uh, as servant leaders, if you want to call it like that, uh, is going to help us to achieve what is the level of maturity or what is the level of confidence the, the organization, the teams, the individuals in the, the organization have. And we can talk with them about can we do a bit more, so if we're in transition we can, can push a bit. And we can see that what is too high a level for them, so we can not use, because then they will become in panic. But if we offer them stuff that they already do, then they are too comfortly. So we have to find out how we can push them a bit into that zone of learning, so the learning zone and the stretch zone. And that's what the common maturity model really tries to do. So um, although it sounds like an auditing model, and I think it is, um, and I'm not happy with that, especially, not specifically at least. Um, but okay, if nobody else is offering it, then someone else is. And uh, I think it's better if we offer it ourselves if we are in the Kanban University. Um, but for me, the most important thing is that the Kanban maturity model really helps coaches and trainers and teachers in organizations to think about how can we help people get out of that comfort zone into the learning zone. So I think that's the, the most important part of it. So, if we look into that first slide again, don't panic. Um, so, the goal is not to, to make them panic. I think I would have stopped this, uh, this video a bit earlier, so because they are still panicking, and that's not a good idea. And as I mentioned up front, uh, I would like to uh, have, have, a, have, a, have a small, a little talk about leadership. And that's because this is uh, the three aspects is also has come together in a mantra. And that mantra is um, outcomes follow practices, practices follow culture, and culture follows values. And therefore, we have to lead uh, with, with values. And what's interesting is that um, if, we, if we want to change the behavior in your organization, then practices are a good idea to start with. So you can look at practices, you can implement practices, because they will influence the outcomes. And um, but before you can change practices, we also have to change culture. And the biggest problem of culture is that it's not, not really changeable. <laughs> There's not, there are not really dials that you can, 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 uh, can uh, how do you call it, pull or something like that, to change the culture. So culture is driven by behavior and by actions by leaders. And uh, I think one of, one of the, um, uh, I've got it somewhere here, yeah, it's a good one. So this is, this is the definition of culture. Um, 
this is the, uh, the, the sum of values times the uh, actions, the behavior of, of the leaders. That's what drives culture. So if we really want to change organizations, then um, I think it's very important to also have the leaders involved and have them commit to that change and have them work out the, the change in that system. Um, but I think that is a topic for a whole other uh, uh, talk, so I think that's what we want to conclude with. And therefore, um, I always have two slides at the end. There is a time for Q&A and no time for Q&A, but uh, because there's still time, I think there is, there is uh, a possibility to do some Q&A if someone has any question. No. Ah, yeah, okay, come on. Okay, go on. Uh, how is do you help the team visualize everything that comes on board? Because it's very often things that goes on in the team that's not on the board. So the question is, how do we visualize everything? And the question, of course, is what do you mean with everything? So let's f revisit that one uh, in a moment. Because there is a lot of going on in the in the team, and you cannot visualize everything. And then you mean like uh, incidents and production disturbances, so smaller items. And also uh, uh, people uh, stealing other stuff and uh, helping the integration team, and uh, I don't know all the all the things that the team uh, is supposed to do that uh, not uh, delivering. Mm. Not I would uh, so so things that uh, you're, you're talking about things that's outside of the delivery board and part of helping other teams or other someone comes along ask you something you have to help them. Um, for me as a coach or a kanban kanbanista, I always say everything you do is work and we should make everything visible and transparent. I understand that every small question, putting it on a sticky note or somewhere in a in a in a system is going to take much more administration than the work you're doing on it, so probably that's not a good idea. But then I, I at least want to see how much of your time are you doing because of ordinary questions, incident management, doing mails, doing phone calls. So I want to know what the capacity of the team is addressed by with other stuff than the stuff that we have on the board. And I would, uh, I would make sure that there is capacity for it. The, the biggest thing I always see is that uh, people say, well, I, I don't put a, put, a put, put a ticket on the wall for an item that only costs me like half an hour or 15 minutes or something. But if you've got 30 of them per day, then you don't do anything else anymore. So what are you doing then? Are you still working? Because I think it's work. So make sure that you put all the work on the board. And if you say, well, that, that costs too much, ad too much administration, then at least have some kind of a, uh, um, a voting system that you know how much time you put in that that kind of work. So I think I, th I would pr put probably everything on the board, but be aware of that administration part. Yeah, good enough. Mm, not yet. Okay, come on, <laughs> trigger me some more. Uh, there's a advice read team topologies, and I think that's that's a good idea. That's about how you structure your organization or your teams with uh, value-driven, I think, stream-aligned teams, they call them, and you've got platform teams, and you've got uh, uh, enabling teams, and I think complex subsystems teams, I think they're called. So those are the four they have. But um, indeed, if you have multiple teams working together, um, if you did anybody go to the, to the, the talk last night from, uh, ah, what was he called? I wrote it down. James Lewis, he did the flow with Lego game. Um, and he, he talked about the whole flow uh, environment. And he said, optimize the whole, make sure that... Because if, if multiple teams are working on the same system, delivering the same stuff to the customer, it's all about bottleneck management within. So the critical path through all those teams. And then also, if you are working for other teams that are more critical than you are, then I think it's okay. But if you are the critical person on the critical path of the system, so the bottleneck of the system, then you should not be the one who is disturbed because you are delivering something that's important and the whole system is relying on your productivity and therefore you have more value and therefore you're a valuable person. Everybody's a valuable person, of course. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah? Great. Yeah, 
so the question is, um, you're more familiar with Scrum, and in Scrum we have a feedback loop called retrospective to constantly improve your environment, or constantly at least once per sprint. That's the continuous improvement part then. Um, and um, how do you do that with Kanban to also continuously improve that, that, uh, that, that process, that work in progress? And um, as I said, in, in Kanban we don't have explicitly other meetings than the Kanban meeting, although in the, the last uh, improvements of Kanban and also in the Kanban books and the Kanban uh, guides, there are, I think, seven cadences. So there, is, there are more uh, cadences going on, so more feedback loops, and that's like uh, your, your, your review meetings and your uh, risk meetings and strategy meetings. So there, there are items in there that is based on process improvement. And we much look at it like a service delivery process. So I think most people who use ITIL or something know what service delivery is all about. And we've got some specific meetings in that place. But in essence, what we think as real lean pre people is that you should not uh, continuously improve every two weeks. You should do it constantly. So we think that the Kanban meeting is a meeting to address what is going on at the moment. But after the Kanban meeting, we should go into Kaizen meetings to fix the problems we have. And if that's something that is impeding the flow, then that's the most important thing to fix because if you have a flow problem, then you also have delivery problems. So uh, the best thing to do with, um, with constantly improving is to have it on a daily or constant basis. So I would rather see it constantly, but because in the West we are very bad with retrospectives, we do a lot of plan, do, but check, act, we leave behind most of the time. So if you do the plan, do, check, act, then um, uh, we, we, we probably we use Scrum because then we at least do once every two weeks or three weeks or four weeks do a real improvement. And that's something we forget in most of the environments. So therefore, it's a good idea to implement something like a retrospective loop. And I would also suggest to do that in Kanban. Um, but preferably, we do it constantly every day based on what the problems are at that moment and then make room for it to fix it. Yeah? Cool. Yeah, um, I have to re recall the question for the people listening in the overflow room, of course. So um, we see that Kanban is coming from more like the lean environment, and lean is more based on a, we, we call it a complicated domain where you've got a re recursive way of working, so you've got a standardized uh, flow, and then you want to optimize that flow. And if you go into the, um, the, the, the environments we are working, software development, they are more complex. So there are more changes going on, and it's more variable. And uh, there we see more things like Scrum going on than, uh, than Kanban. And uh, the question is, do I see Kanban working in those kind of environments also? And um, for, for me, the, the most important thing is that when, when David created it, it came from feature-driven development. It was one of the Agile uh, methods when uh, the Agile Manifesto was written. Um, and he created uh, it both on that idea and the theory of constraint of gold law, the goal, that's part of the, the whole idea behind Kanban. And uh, the Kanban we know from Lean is with the, the, the small letter K and not the capital K. And we, uh, David created the, the, the capital K Kanban, and that's Kanban for evolutionary change system. So it's, it's for more like in a complex system. But I agree that, um, in essence, the uh, flow system, I think it's important in every flow workflow environment, uh, but it doesn't really consider that complexity that's where, where Scrum is all about and have that feedback loop also with the customer. Um, but of course, you can implement you can implement Scrum with Kanban. I can uh, if, if I give a, if I give a Kanban training, I will say that to the to the crowd. If I do a Scrum training, of course I won't. But if I say uh, say it to a Kanban crowd, I say, well, Scrum is just a specific Kanban implementation with 13 rules. So uh, the explicit policies we've got in place in Scrum are, can also be done in a Kanban system. Um, but Kanban um, is delivering us the possibility to get rid of them, that's 
a number of those rules that get it maybe get in the way. So the most important one, I think, is to uh, to cut between the planning moment and the delivery moment. We don't have an iteration. We can plan whatever we want and we can deliver whatever we want. And I think that's what's going on at the moment. We've got a continuous delivery pipelines and we don't have to wait a sprint to deliver something, of course. And Scrum is coming along with that because they say you're allowed to deliver more than once per sprint. Um, but Common explicitly made it possible to get rid of that iteration and make a planning and delivery uh, a feedback loop on a different uh, level. So I think um, I think Kanban is very usab usable in production and development uh, environments. The only thing is that you get less, uh, less rules uh, to work with, and therefore it's probably you need some more maturity to put it into a good practice, and that's, that's probably the difficulty. So Kanban looks simple, but therefore it isn't more simple to implement. It's more, more difficult to implement if you do it right, if you want to do it right. Um, but I think that's the same with Scrum. You can completely uh, uh, create an environment that's not good with Scrum. I want to call a different world, but um, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. Yeah? Um, do you prioritize then that there's multiple tools for this? How do you identify where a company starts and, and they do at this point, but it will take long enough to see where this world is at? Yeah, so the question is, Kaizen is a lot of small steps, and how do you know if an organization is already in that small step thinking? Ready for the next yeah, so... For yeah, yeah, so, and I think that's, that's also that's part of the... So if you look at the, the Deming cycle, the plan, do, check, act loop, then we also have a standardization step, and I think that's what's, what's in the, the common maturity model, that's what we call consolidation. So we have to look into... Uh, the maturity model and look at all the practices and um, indeed it's it's a good question to uh, to it I think it's difficult for a coach to know based on a book where they are in the in the in the flow because you don't know of course so I think this is uh, sensitivity this is uh, finger spits and gefühl um, a good coach knows more than what's in the book, so so you can do a lot of stuff based on feeling and talking with people and those kind of things. So um, this will help you find out if you're in transition on what level of consolidation in what level, based on the practices, but you still have to think and feel and talk and be a coach. Because um, I'm not sure if you, uh, if, you, if you do football or soccer or something like that, but in the Netherlands we had a, we had a coach who was tremendously good with the, the Dutch football team, the, the national football team. And then he went to Australia and he did some really good stuff. And then he went to South Korea, he did some good stuff, and to Russia and some good stuff. And they all got into the first three of the world, pretty much, or four. And then he came back to the Netherlands and he completely sucked at that team. It didn't work at all. And it's, it's not because he didn't know what to do, because he did it like a yeah, decennia of, uh, of uh, helping teams to improve and it worked very well and suddenly it didn't work. So it's not because he didn't know the book, but it just didn't work. And that's also something that we have to be aware of. So it's, it's not only following the book, but it's also f feeling what is the level and where are they at the moment and, uh, and then deciding what to do. So I always, if, if there are people in here doing coaching, I always suggest Lee uh, creating your own blog post, your logging and always define, uh, this is my hypothesis, I'm going to do this, and what will happen then, I think this. And um, so I always try to revisit my hypotheses, and I know that in a complex environment, the hypothesis with something that will work, will not work the next time the same, the same way. So that's just something that you have to be aware of. Yeah? Thank you. We've got six minutes if someone still has a question. No? Then, uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's the lights. Yeah. 
So your question is, uh, it looks like the Kemba maturity model aims for Nirvana, level six. Um, but your question is, is it also okay to stop at a certain level, like say three or four and not go any further? Because maybe going further may even, uh, and I think that that's the case. It might even frustrate the, the teams because I think level, and I think it starts at level four already. You really need leadership involvement and sponsorship and uh, if you go to five and six, it's like the higher level of strategic thinking on leadership level and sea level. And uh, therefore, it's not something that you really can influence on the team level anymore. So I think it's a very good idea, and th that's probably also that I've seen a lot, is that, uh, and I did myself, is uh, frustrating the teams by telling them what what gold is on the other side of the of the rainbow and in, in Nirvana, and they never achieved it, so they got really frustrated about it because there was a ceiling of management they couldn't uh, pull through. So I think it's very good to uh, to also be aware that sometimes this is enough, and then uh, and th I think that might also be what you asked for, and then standardize on that level, and then the next step is going to be a leadership change and not uh, having teams fight for more. Uh, maturity because that probably won't work. So I think you're uh, completely right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, you, I, I I see a conforming nod, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> cool. More questions? Okay, then uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, there is a common maturity book. I'm not going to market for it, but just for people who wanted to know more about it. And you can also look it up at uh, the KMN Plus uh, website. Um, thanks, thank you for being here. I hope uh, it was interesting, and I hope you got something from it and that you will put into practice. And if you have any questions also about Kanban or other agile things, uh, because all, th all those developers here, uh, I can talk about those kind of things with you if you want. Yeah? Okay, have a good day. Thank you.